Okay, so we're going to begin our last session of the day, Teaching Fascism. I am Rob Linnae. I'm a professor of education at Adelphi University here in New York. And I'm also on the board of directors of the Remember the Triangle Factory Fire here in New York. Before I uh, introduce our panelists, I want to just briefly share uh, a relevant artifact that showed up in my mailbox yesterday. It's a very uh, professionally produced mailing that came to our house. It's a very union house, but we got this mailing. It says, teacher unions are teaching leftist ideology in our New York schools. Learn how you can stop them. <laughs> and it's from a, a group called Freedom Foundation. Uh, who, who could be against Freedom Foundation? But I do want to say before we begin that um, the people who are doing this work in schools and universities are operating under a totally different environment than we were just a few years ago, especially in the K through 12 area. Just in a matter of years, the turnaround has been dramatic and quick and vicious. Um, a few years ago, we had a, a revival of teacher unionism in Chicago, West Virginia. I was very encouraging and, uh, and then teachers were heroes in COVID. And then since then, we have just uh, been slammed hard. There seems to be a new front open uh, in the war by the far right. Uh, school board meetings are often devolved into chaos with pushing, shoving, threats of violence. Um, there's anti-CRT laws being passed, don't say gay laws being passed. Uh, censorship uh, laws, it's, it's all coming at us very quickly. So I, I do appreciate that we are talking about education in, in one of the sessions today because it's, it is a totally different environment. Our, our first uh, speakers are with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade here in New York. Um, they will be speaking on anti-fascism in the classroom, lessons from the Spanish Civil War and the Abraham Lincoln Br Brigade. Uh, Dennis Meany is the executive assistant at the Brigade Archives, and Nancy Wallach is an educator, a board member, and daughter of Brigadista, Brigadista High Wallach. Thank you. You know, I'll put that up on this later. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Great. Um, like I like uh, I was introduced. My name is Dennis Meany. I'm the executive assistant here at the Abraham Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive. Um, so I will be speaking first. Then my uh, colleague Nancy Wallach will be taking over after. So we will be discussing two portions of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive mission, which is the Watt Prize, which is a essay contest for pre-collegiate undergraduate and graduate students on on scholarship on the Spanish Civil War, anti-fascism and anti-fascism. And we'll be talking about our teaching institutes, which which um, provide K through 12 teachers, uh, Spanish Civil War, and Abraham Lincoln Brigade curriculum for the classroom. So I'll be begin with, uh, for, the, for those who don't know, which this is sort of a left wing space, so I think many might know, um, that the, uh, the, what the Abraham Lincoln Brigade was. So the Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, was uh, during the Spanish Civil War, which was 1936 to 1939. Almost 40,000 men and women from 52 countries, including 2,800 Americans, volunteered to tra travel to Spain to join the international brigades to help fight fascism. The U.S. volunteers who served in various units came to be known as the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Um, so that's what that is. Uh, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive, which is a which is the organization of which we represent, is an educational nonprofit dedicated to promoting social activism and the defense of human rights. Alba's work is inspired by those American volunteers who fought fascism in the Spanish Civil War, and we draw upon the Alba's collection at New York University's Tamamet Library, and working, we are working to expand such collections across the country, uh, using them to um, preserve the legacy of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade as an in inspiration for future and present generations. Um, so that's sort of our mission statement, but I will just sort of say in more layman's terms, we are a 501c3 educational nonprofit, and again, our primary output is educational and cultural programming. Um, and this, we do this to raise awareness of the kind of forgotten historiography of the Spanish Civil War and Abraham Lincoln Brigade and American anti-fascism in general. Um, so we do this through two 
two means, which I mentioned previously, the George Watt Prize to connect with students and the teaching institutes to connect with educators. So, and I, again, I think uh, one way in which uh, this is sort of, uh, this organization was introduced to me and I think about how it's kind of the way in which uh, students and teachers are connected to, uh, to like this sort of not looked at historiography is sort of cliche. I don't know if anybody read in college the people's hist Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States of America, some, something of a cliche, but I read that and it gave me a new different perspective on American history and our place in the world. And also I think that when we show, when we provide these educational resources to teachers and, and nurture student scholarships, it provides a similar type of experience. So uh, I will go on to talk a little bit about the Watt Award. So this is a George Watt Prize named in honor of Brigadista George Watt. Um, so it's an annual essay contest we've been hosting since 1998 to honor George Watt, who was a writer and lifelong activist central to the creation of ALBA. So one of the founding members of VALB, which was the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and then helped organize ALBA as an educational nonprofit we are today. So in regards to like the the parameters of the contest, students from anywhere in the world are invited to submit an essay or thesis chapter about any aspect of the Spanish Civil War, the global political and cultural struggles against fascism in the 1920s and 30s, or of the lifetime histories and contributions of the international volunteers who fought in support of the Spanish Republic from 1936 to 1938. So I will get show some, um, some winners of this award in a moment so we can get an idea of what um, uh, what the what we what the criteria for submission is um, so I'm gonna go one more this is our some of our winners from the past past three years but I will also note that we have been doing this this contest for a long time and the current chair of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade archive Sebastian Faber is a former Watt award winner from the year 2000 so if you know I there are students in the room I would, I would encourage you to submit an essay and you may be the chair of the, our board in the future so that'd be nice um, so again, I think um, just to kind of highlight the award, you can see from here, these are 2022, 2021, and 2020 winners. We have it from multiple continents, we have from Europe, America, from both Ivies and uh, state flagships, you know, from Princeton, U of Chicago, you know, University of Manchester, University of Leeds, uh, from Vienna, and all these other places, right? Some within the area and some not. Um, and so we do take a wide range of students um, student, student submissions, and these are obviously just the winners, and we do have a very large breadth. We take uh, essays, essays in from all over the country, and all over Europe, and um, all over Europe as well, and as well as Latin America. Um, like, again, I, uh, the, again, you can kind of see some of the scholarship that we've been nurturing. So, um, for instance, um, the, on the 2022, one of the prize winners was Alfie Norris, who wrote a history of working class history in Wakefield, in uh, working class history in Wakefield, which is um, an area near uh, near Leeds. Um, and so it was kind of his way of discovering a historiography of his community of brigadistas who returned from Spain and you know were members of the labor movement from that time going forward. You can also see from Louis Madriel, who is one of our graduate prize winners for 2022, he has he was engaged directly with our archival material, the Frederica Martin papers. Frederica Martin was a nurse within the American Medical Bureau, which was the um, the the nurses who went to go um, serve the Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War. So you can see the kind of the kind of picture I'm painting. We have a lot of topics and also a lot of different winners. Um, and I think one of the reasons we do this is to, uh, for a few, uh, kind of two reasons. Number one, we want to nurture the scholarship and make sure it, be, it, be, it continues to be as broad as this, but also to um, allow these students, um, you know, have the scholarship also inform maybe their political work, right? They're connecting their own, their, their scholarship to their activism today and how do they inform, how do the struggles of the past inform their anti-fascist struggles in the present? So, um, Again, I would I want to again circle back and say if there are any students in the audience, they should think about submitting a a prize a, a, a essay to us next year. We open the contest in March of 2023, and due date will be in July of 2023. And I'd love to see a Hofstra winner there. That would be very nice. Okay, um, so thank you for letting me talk about the Watt Prize. I'm going to turn the podium over to my colleague Nancy Wallach to talk about our teaching institutes. 
uh, which f which um, which help bring anti fascism anti fascism into the K through 12 classroom. Is it, is it on? Mike's on. Okay. Thank thank you, Dennis, and thank you to the organizers of this conference today. It's my pleasure to share with you the lessons the ALBA teaching institutes have created for public school teachers throughout the country about the Spanish anti-fascist war and the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. But before I do, I'd like to share with you the lessons in the larger sense, the lessons about international solidarity and resistance that inform why we offer these institutes and why we think it is so important to bring our history into classrooms in the US, particularly in this period, fraught with the danger of the rise of fascism in our own country as well as abroad. In the 1930s, when the democratically elected government of Spain put forth a program of universal education, free health care, land reform, women's rights, and free trade unions for people who had never before even experienced the luxury of a weekend, Franco led a right a wing of the military in a rebellion, aided by the invasion and assistance of Mussolini's and, and Hitler's military and state-of-the-art weaponry, which they were testing in a dress rehearsal for World War II. In an unprecedented act of working class solidarity, people from 52 nations came to the defense of the Republic, who were being denied the right to purchase weapons or aircraft by the so-called Neutrality Act enforced by Britain, France, and the United States. The war against fascism in Spain is sometimes referred to as the first battle of World War II, and yet it is not in our history books. When I was going to school and I told my classmates my father had fought in the Spanish Civil War, I remember them telling me, well, he must be a very old man because they thought I meant the Spanish-American War. Why do we think it's so important at ALBA to include the stories of these brave men and women from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade who defended Spanish democracy and tried to stop the fascist aggression that resulted in World War II. Why do we think it's so important to tell the stories of these people who have been written out of history, who instead of being honored were often punished or ignored or had their records distorted in an effort to lessen their power to inspire a new generation of activists? I think Robin Kelly explains our mission very well, and in that Howard Zinn history, which Dennis referred to, uh, Robin Kelly says, quote, the international brigades represent perhaps the greatest example of internationalism in the 20th century. They volunteered not only to defend one country, but to defend humanity. They honestly believed that old labor slogan, an injury to one is an injury to all. And best of all, these men and women never quit. They returned home to continue the good fight, battling Nazism in World War II, opposing US racism at home, and US interventions in the Americas. They reached out to Franco's political prisoners and still marching in 2000, this time they demanded the removal of a US Navy that uses Vieques Puerto Rico as a military firing range. We need to make it a part of our collective memory, our common story, our common knowledge. And if we do, perhaps future generations will embrace the idea that the struggle for democracy knows no boundaries. And if we do, kids of all ages may very well hold up their fists, continue the good fight, and say to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, no passerant. I can't hold up my fists now. 
because they're both full, but the Lincoln vets not only continued the good fight as part of their local peace, civil rights, and labor unions, but also as members of the organization they founded the year they got back from Spain, the Veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, or VALB. They never stopped trying to expose the fascist brutality of our Cold War ally, Franco. And as keynote speaker Harry Belafonte said at one of the Valve's first uh, commemorate, not first commemorations, but I would say in the 1970s, the first time he spoke at one of three uh, times he spoke for them, uh, he said, he said uh, Spain, apartheid in South Africa, Native American rights, it's all the same struggle. So now that the last American veteran of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade has passed, ALBA has taken up the educational mission so that teachers may arm students with the knowledge and forgotten history of these powerful role models. I met with a Hunter College student last spring who said yes, he knew about the writers and artists like Hemingway or Picasso, but it was when he learned about the ordinary working people in the Lincoln Brigade who rose to such heights when inspired by extraordinary circumstances that he felt he too could act, could become involved, and could do something. The uh, slide you're seeing behind me, the page on my father, Hi Wallach, is from Alba's online biographical database on the volunteers, and it's one of the resources that Alba makes available on its website to the teachers in the institutes we offer, to their students, to the George Watt applicants, and indeed to anyone wanting to learn more about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade you can access any one of the volunteers alphabetically, where their military records are supplemented by clippings, interviews, articles contributed by immediate family members. And as so many of them persisted in their activism, these links are often uh, substantial. And while it's a part of my personal history, of course, it's also a part of our collective history, which cannot be accurately taught if this segment is buried or ignored. The, uh, another such resource we offer and can be accessed on our website are standards-based lesson plans and subject area guides in both Spanish and English. Uh, primary source materials include the children's drawings, which were produced at the uh, colonias in Spain when the uh, children were sheltered from the uh, bombings by uh, Hitler and Mussolini, and um, was the first example of art therapy, and that's up there. Uh, the World War II letters from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade explaining why they fought in Spain. Uh, Spanish Civil War poster resources, teaching units such as African Americans in the Spanish Civil War, music, songs, videos. And in this slide, you see the critical thinking skills, the essential questions that teachers can use to get children thinking as they engage with primary source materials. And to highlight a few, what are our obligations in the face of injustice? What does fascism look like today? And this one, when do historical analogies apply, is an especially important one because it corrects those distortions that I mentioned in the brigade's record. For instance, I can remember when attempts were made to liken the Lincoln Brigade to the Green Berets in Vietnam or to justify the invasion of Iraq when regime change was erroneously compared to the brigade's defense of the democratically elected government of Spain, when in fact, it was the fascists attempting to overthrow the legally elected government of Spain who wanted regime change. Detailed lesson plans range across topics such as anti-communism and civil rights during the McCarthy era and isolationism to interventionism, examining US policy towards Spain. When I attended one of the pre-COVID teaching institutes in person, 
I found I myself had become one of the primary sources of oral history. And when the teachers found out I was a daughter of a Lincoln vet, they peppered me with all kinds of questions at breakfast and at our lunch break. And in those pre-COVID times, when we had our in-person institutes all over the country, we were in as far-flung places as Oberlin, Ohio, Portland, Seattle, New York City, and New Jersey. Our online workshops since COVID the past three years are now nationally attended with a registration of over 100 plus this year. And now in the uh, next slide, we're going to, uh, our next slide. Oh, okay. So our next slide is uh, one that is coming up imminently uh, in, on uh, November 8th. America and World Fascism, Human Rights from the Spanish Civil War to Nuremberg and Beyond. And this is a free online workshop from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we've actually um, extended our registration <laughs> deadline. So if uh, anyone here is, is interested in accessing it, and you can do the registration on our website. And it's for uh, teachers social, uh, in grades 4 through 12 of social studies, Spanish, and other world language teachers, English language arts teachers. And of course, um, you don't have to be a teacher, but they will receive. You can be a student or anyone interested in these topics. But they, they will receive 10 hours of New York State Education Department approved continuing teacher and leader education credit. And in these institutes, as it mentions, which have already reached thousands, they'll experience hands-on, inquiry-based activities to engage students with this powerful political and philosophical subject. They'll create standards-based classroom activities and receive access to ready-made lesson plans. And it's a significant achievement of ALBA to have New York City public school teachers receive professional development credit for their participation and to be able to choose our institute during a citywide mandated professional development day. And we'll continue to bring the legacy of resistance, struggle, and unity of these powerful role models, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, onto the radar and into the classrooms of future generations. And again, we invite and we urge anyone who is here today and just wants to learn more about it, this is a great way to. So please join us, and here's the registration information. Thank you. Jeremy Sarikan will speak on media literacy as a form of anti-fascist activism. Jeremy is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Media and Communication at St. John Fisher University. He looks to infuse his courses with issues of social justice in courses such as staging resistance and in media research and analytics, where the clients this semester include the local chapter of Veterans for Peace and an environmental activist group. Number four. Yes. Cool. No. Fine. There we go. <laughs> Hello, I am Jeremy Sarakin. Uh, I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank all of you for still being here today at this late hour. And thankful for this panel, because I think it's important, obviously, as we've been said already, that we speak about these issues and how we teach them, as well as how we study them. Uh, this presentation I'm going to give for, to you today in the next 15 minutes or so is both sort of my personal journey a little bit in terms of teaching uh, these sorts of issues, as well as how I incorporated it into a media class. I realize that most professors here are not in media studies, but hopefully there's enough here that is applicable to all. Um, 
I promise this is the most boring slide. I like to consider myself humble, whether or not it's true. Um, I've been um, a media professor for 17 years. I'm at St. John Fisher University. We actually just became a university uh, like six months ago. Um, and we were a college, and we still very much consider ourselves a, li a liberal arts college. Um, I think that's important. We're in uh, Western New York, in Rochester. And um, even though New York State is, is blue, we all know it's very much a spectrum um, from very blue to very red uh, in terms of the pol political spectrum. And all those students come to us. And so that's always, and I'm sure that's true at a lot of other schools as well. So that's always sort of a consideration. Um, how do we hear students as well as speak to the things that we need to speak about? Um, I'm also a documentary filmmaker, um, I'm also a theater artist. Uh, I think the group here might appreciate. Uh, in 2017, I directed and co-wrote a fringe festival piece called Home of the Brave, uh, Life in the Trump Era. And so, um, so I've been involved with these issues, both sort of in my teaching as well as sort of beyond. And actually, I'm very happy now that I've started to teach theater as well. Um, you don't, don't always need a degree if you do it for 30 years. You can convince people. Um, I've thought that I would start with this, of talking about sort of my own experiences. Uh, this is actually around 2007 this happened. Um, I used the article, as you can see here, Race in for Cyberspace, Identity Tourism and Racial Passing on the Internet by Lisa Nakamura, who I believe is at University of Michigan at, at Ann Arbor. Um, and this article, this journal article, uh, talks about the, of what basically what identity tourism is, that people go online, they pretend to be someone else, um, often they pick another race or another gender in ways that are very stereotypical and very offensive, and they do it for various reasons. And it was sort of a thing that people unfortunately do, and she writes a lot about these sorts of um, online issues. Um, I sort of took this, and I was talking about gaming in my class, and we talked about how um, if you, and this is 2007, keep in mind, if you um, ask someone in a multiplayer game, who are you playing against? If you don't know, they're going to assume that you're a white teenager. That's kind of the assumption, a white male teenager, actually. And then we got into issues of, or we had the discussion of, um, what if someone says, I'm not that, I'm black, or you know, I'm a woman. And, and those, especially then, people, they get harassed. And people in the class would say, well, uh, just don't say that. We're all the same. Why do people even bring up who they are? And then we talked about, well, don't you have the right to do that? Would you really want to be everyone to assume you're a white male 16-year-old? And those issues, which I thought were not that com like I thought that was like pretty like an easy place to go, and I was very naive. Um, people were rather angry at some of the things happening. I've had these, this, this particular discussion more recently, and I have to give them credit. The new gen the newest generation seems to be like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like those sort of issues, I'm seeing they've changed despite everything else, well, the typical sort of 18, 19 year old. But in 2007, that wasn't the case. And I realized like, I need to stop shying away from these issues. These are actually interesting. This is actually what teaching can be about. Jump ahead, 2016 election. Um, I used, I'll talk about this briefly. I used all the uh, candidates, Trump, Clinton, and Sanders ads. And we talked about how are they the same? How are they different? You know, and people, tried to get a political very quickly. And I kept saying, we're, we're doing visual semiotics here. We're talking about what we're seeing, and we're talking about you know, what, are the sort of the, what are the metaphors, what are the things that we understand. And it was a way to talk about politics, help them understand it, without sort of getting lost too much in political views didn't actually matter in that particular case. And that sort of distinction has become very important in media classes, that we can talk about these things, and not that we don't want to have other discussions, but we don't have to I always have to get lost in them. And that's been very useful. Um, it's interesting to note that I always think about like, you know, rallies look like rallies no matter who's doing them. Um, I'm teaching a documentary film class right now, and I found this is a very effective pairing is to show an excerpt from Triumph of the Will, I really can't watch more than a few minutes, and follow it up with Night and Fog, if you know that, in one class. Um, the, if you don't know the film, look it up. It's, it's, it's quite a pairing, and it's very effective. Um, so getting to, media, getting to the actual media classes. Um, I won't read all of this, but in general, the way intro to mass communication, intro to media classes are presented, and this sort of makes me crazy a little bit at this point, is they go by type of media. 
So you have a chapter on books, and a chapter on magazines, and, and this is actually from the latest edition. And it's a, this is a great book that we actually have used and we might use again, just use it the way we want to. Um, you know, a chapter, a book on movies and, and television. Um, I found another book that I actually uh, liked more, although unfortunately it was written at almost too high a level for 100 level students, which I discovered where it's dealing with uh, economics, pol politics, uh, media organizations, you can see media and ideology without getting into the individual media types. And I actually found this was much more useful in terms of sort of getting at heavier issues, which I, which I like more. Um, and this sort of is reflected in the course goals. I took this from a syllabus at Baylor. I honestly did a web search. There's millions of syllabi. You can look at it. It's a, it's a good way to figure out what to do in a class sometimes. Um, and they're, they're all like this. So I, this was a good representation, but a lot of them are like this. Well, we're we're in a typical media class, you're basically looking at you know, economic, political, and social implications. You're thinking about um, how the technologies themselves matter. That's back to Marshall McLuhan. You know, it's very different to hear a news story on social media versus in print versus on TV and how that affects people. And that's the kind of thing we talk about. Uh, media convergence, this one to me is almost getting a little bit old. The fact that everything's becoming digital, that was sort of revolutionary 20 years ago. Now it's like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, uh, and then uh, how media affects you. And then, you know, of course, what job you're gonna get. So the way we've started doing it a little bit differently is we still talk about economics and how it uh, is, reflects decision-making by large corporations. Uh, we really look at sort of media texts to think about cultural norms. Why do we behave the way we do? And why do we have the expect expectations we do? And why do we make the choices in life we do because of what we see in the media? Um, media and politics is a huge thing. Um, I've talked a lot about media representation. Um, and this goes back to the issues we're talking about today. If you watch different groups on TV and you take the time to do that, you're going to have more of an appreciation than if you don't and you're less likely to be racist, homophobic, et cetera. And so why do these shows exist and why is it important that they're there and who makes them? Why is that important as well? Um, we talk about, um, again, how to analyze media texts and then the global influence of media, but very much social media. I actually changed the name of the course from Intro to Mass Communication to Intro to Media. I don't think a lot of many schools have done this yet from what I can tell because social media is such an important part of everyone's experience and it's not quite a mass communication. It's sort of a, this sort of weird hybrid. And so we did that just to embrace that. Um, so to simplify, the last part of my talk is really just give you five things I do in class which get to ideas of social justice, anti-fascism um, in different ways. Um, but the idea of convergence and also media conglomerates. This isn't every media class. This isn't some new thing I came up with at all. The fact that um, very few companies own everything. Um, how do you deal with news bias? And it's not that you have to avoid news bias. That's kind of impossible. And it wasn't the way news was a couple hundred years ago. All news was biased. We just had this period where it seemed less biased. But how do you know that? Um, the importance of representation I made reference to. Mainstream activism, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. And then social media. And then I, I do a, a unit on hashtag, or a couple days on hashtag activism. So it's Mickey Mouse. So this, I don't need the details of this. I, we go into detail in class. But basically, the idea that students don't realize everyone, a few companies own everything. And they're the gatekeepers. And it's, it's important to how we understand what media we're seeing and what they're trying to tell us. Um, people go, oh, yeah, Marvel. Isn't it cool that like they use, you know, they have Marvel comics or they have Marvel movies on the Disney Channel? It's because they own it. And they make all the money. And that, you know, you know, Disney owns Marvel and ESPN. And, you know, you can actually spend an hour and a half looking at this chart because it's all these little companies that they own. It's a lot. <laughs> and it's in this nice Mickey, you know, persona. Um, this is a chart that some of you may have seen. Uh, the ad fonts media is, is sort of pushes it a lot. We, I, at least I get a lot of emails about it. They keep updating it, which is good. Um, and it's, they're trying to, they basically do their best to sort of scientifically figure out where is media on the, both in terms of left, right, but also in terms of like being actually truthful. And so obviously the center is like, you know, AP is still pretty much close to the center. A uh, Reuters, PBS is just slightly left of center, but you know, pretty high up. And then you have the far left and far right stuff that you know they're they're making the stuff up, both for the most part. And so, and of course, you know, other other very uh, politicized groups have put out their own chart, which is like this completely shifted one way or the other. But they seem to be doing a fairly good job of this. And we talk, and I tell the students, you have to watch more than one. You have to read more than one. Um, don't rely on any one media. The kind of thing that they don't know. I mean, I'm, sometimes I'm sad they don't watch anything. But at least, you know, if you're going to watch something, watch two or three. 
and stay to near the top of the chart, I say. Um, another exercise I do with them, which I used to teach media research, is uh, this Freedom Forum. So now I'm worried about what the group is, because I hadn't really thought it through. But, like, they, but they do this great thing where they, every single day, they put the front page of about a couple hundred newspapers um, online. So you can go on a given day, and it's that day. It's sort of, I don't know who, do, they have some work study student doing it. I think it's great. But, um, I don't know. but basically, I've done this thing where students in a given day have to basically spend one class period looking at um, how many headlines are local, how many are national. Then I ask them to, as a group, decide whether it's liberal or conservative. And I say that's not quite how research would work, but you know, we're doing the one class. Um, and then we usually find that we look at literally in one class period, every, each group of 10 has to do 10 papers. So we do 100. And the liberal, uh, it, it works every time. The liberal conservative, in the end, comes out to almost neutral, if you take all the papers as a group. It work, I've done it like six times, and it always works. Um, and it's just the idea that this is how, in a very small way, this is how research works, but also how newspapers are all different, and how, you, again, you have to read them for, the, um, for what they are, and just for one example. Um, I, I will. I'll go a little quicker now. So just, I talk about representation. We talk about shows. This is atypical and pose and how they're effective and how it's, basically this has changed and how, and then I show them these old clips from like All in the Family um, and Mary Tyler Moore showing just how far we sort of come, you know, and they were the ones trying to do it better back in the 70s and most shows weren't like that. And we, we talk about that. Um, this is uh, Donald Glover's as Childish Gambino's This is America video. Hopefully you've seen it. If not, watch it tonight in your hotel room. Um, it's four minutes. And I, I looked it up before because it changes all the time. It's something like 850 million people have watched this on YouTube. And this is what I meant by mainstream activism. This is an amazingly interesting uh, music video about gun violence. Um, and I actually spent an hour with this, a whole, a whole, uh, a whole, uh, yeah, an entire lesson on this. And we basically do, again, a semiotic analysis where we look at it moment by moment. I keep hitting pause. We talk about, like, what are we seeing? What meta it's, all th it's filled with metaphors. It's brilliant. And we sort of talk about it. And as a, something that sort of it won awards, um, something that many, many, many people have seen, millions and millions, and still it's certainly a form of activism and how this exists and how it's an important thing. So, um, this is this is this could be its own twenty minute talk. But we talk we have long conversations about how social media is affecting them. A lot of them only get their news from social media, and that's it. And we talk about okay, fine. Who's sharing that? My friends. Do your friends have the same political view? Okay, so you're not getting any other view, right? Right. And we talk about bubbles, and these are all things that they haven't given that much thought to. Keep in mind again, this is eighteen year olds, you know, at, at, at college, and um, you know, are you? So are you making assumptions without seeing any news? Is all your news from social media? And even if it's, are you sure it's from actual reliable sources? Then we go back to that chart from before. All those sort of connections we try to make in the class. Um, and then near the end of the class, I talk about more sort of like hashtag activism, um, just, just different examples, and sort of just how this has worked and how social media can be used for these productive um, ideas and how to get sort of messages out about things we should be concerned about. And as I say, so this is sort of very, hopefully, more relevant to today's talk. Um, we also look at hashtag and how research can be done with with hashtags and how, and you know, and this is something I'm sure everyone here knows, but no, Antifa is basically this term now that's used by the far right, and people have actually done studies using various Twitter tools uh, and doing data visualizations to show that, like we can tell who's who's saying these things in hashtags, and, and sort of track it that way, and we look at how this research is being done. So I've turned the intro of the media class into uh, something that I think is more about at least social justice and anti-fascism. Um, typically, anti, uh, int intro to media is economics, media effects, and there's ways to do more and to do better, I think. And that's what I hope to tell you today. Thank you. Michael Vavris is Professor Emeritus of Interdisciplinary Studies at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington, and is past, past president of the Associ Association of Independent Liberal Arts Colleges for Teacher Education. His latest book is Teaching Anti-Fascism, A Critical Multicultural Pedagogy for Civil Engagement.
That's not a good start. <laughs> yeah, it just stopped. need to get mine up there. Whew. Wow. I could done none of this right now. I'm official. All right, thanks a lot for being here on this late afternoon. Uh, just a, a point, uh, I'm located in Olympia, Washington. I mentioned this to some the speaker from Australia and, and it, it didn't compute. This is the west coast of the United States. It's on the interstate corridor, Seattle, Olympia, Portland. We've had the Patriot Prayer Group come to our campus, our liberal president said we all should leave we didn't all leave so it's been uh, a very interesting location to be and I would just say you know my standpoint uh, how I approach this has been influenced uh, significantly by the presenters in the second panel this morning so and so I try to take this my ultimate population is k-12 teachers and teacher education programs to move this along um, and in education, when we say education, the American Educational Research Association, which is one, if not the largest research organization in the world, is almost silent on anything to do with anti-fascism. They have thousands of papers every year. A search of their database last year and this year produces one paper on anti-fascism, mine. So, and it's seen as almost a curiosity that why would you be bringing that up? Um, so let me just start here with this. Um, of course, I did a 20 page paper for 20 minutes here. Uh, so uh, some of the presenters have talked about bringing uh, anti fascism to the local level. The far right has brought it to the local level, as Rob uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, to local school boards. So as we see from this quote here, but who made that quote? None other than Steve Bannon, former advisor to President Trump. So this notion to start with uh, school boards, uh, we, s we find that we have this extreme form of anti-intellectual civic education being uh, at pushed, advocated. And it's to me, it's very similar to the socialization that went on in 20th century uh, historical fascism in Europe. Suffused with indoctrination and absolutism, fascist intellectualism during the interwar years spread throughout the school curriculum and extracurricular activities. So one piece I feel that I do with students, I do go back historically, and for here, for this particular presentation, I focus on one of the traits of historical fascism using a typology, and that's anti-intellectualism. And this illustrates one of the, uh, it's hinged on fascist control of schools where we politicize the young, and what's the purpose of that? So that they can serve as the vanguard for patriarchal, racist, ultra-nationalism. Also, the educational absolutism shuts down any sort of reason debate, civic discourse. 
then the militarization and indoctrination of youth, especially uh, the parallel I see is with a junior ROTC, that's the military for those from Europe, uh, on our campuses, uh, uh, high schools. And the whole idea is you sacrifice your individuality for collective engagement in violence. Echoes of fascistic educational absolutism are not new to the US. The 1974 case of the West Virginia Kanawha County textbook controversy set a political tone over the place of multiculturalism, religion, sexuality, and gender in the public school curriculum for the next half century. Far-right activists at this time found support in massive protests against textbooks and curricular practices that in any way appeared to contradict white supremacist evangelical Christian values. Protesters in the West Virginia state capitol firebombed homes of textbook supporters, shot at school buses, fired on schools, dynamited the district's office, violently attacked and injured the school superintendent, the assistant superintendent, and two school board members. The Trump encouraged January 6th coup attempt at the US Capitol is a vivid example and indicator of the history of political violence by the far right that has now spilled into school board meetings. Much like 20th, and oh, it's been also reframed by some evangelicals as good guys with guns. Much like 20th century fascist leaders who justified the use of redemptive violence because established state institutions failed to carry out ultranationalistic liberation, contemporary neo-fascists find confirmation of their turn to violence as a kind of divine righteousness. The far right considers their fascistic techniques, tactics as valid means to supposedly protect school children and their homeland against ideologically constructed domestic enemies, such as migrant refugees, Muslim, Black Lives Matter protesters, LGBTQ plus populations, and a multicultural curriculum. So one approach, I go back, I try to separate out historical fascism from contemporary far-right extremism. And for our purposes here, the, the most simplistic way is I, I center white supremacist nationalism, not white supremacy, not white nationalism, white supremacy nationalism. And with that, we have the basis, the center of far-right extremism. Uh, we see anti-government, violent anti-government insurgency, evangelical Christian absolutism, and misogynistic post-feminism that denies the gains of feminism and would like to turn those back. So it's using these fascistic techniques to help students kind of see what's the framework going on. Um, and I tell them that this gives us a chance to kind of dolly back and pause for a moment and consider what is happening and they're truly curious about this. The centrality of white supremacy sounds eerily similar to the fascist ideology of Nazi racial th theory that was the principal determinant of how Germans would treat the conquered people and that various nationalities would be wooed on the grounds that they were Aryans. Much like we see today with individuals in various ethnic groups desiring and claiming whiteness. During 2021-22 school year, 138 school districts in 32 states banned more than 2,500 books. These districts include over 5,000 schools and enroll almost 4 million students. I don't know if you can see the small print of that bar graph, but basically the largest one deals with uh, themes related to sexual and gender minorities, prominent characters of color, um, followed by sexual content, issues of race and racism, themes of rights and activism, this vague category biographical material, and stories of religious minorities. 
Fascist violence looms over book banning that includes involvement of police and military, paramilitaries. Far right, and <clears throat> skipping ahead here, the far right dark money helps to fuel a war against public schools. In his formative years, in the 1970s, the now well-endowed Heritage Foundation stated that schools were teaching students to embrace racism, fascism, or any other is ism, including one that was brought up here earlier today, cannibalism. <laughs> so that was 1974, and the parents, quote, must stop trusting public education, so this is a half a century ago, and therefore should attack school board meetings by any means necessary. The conspiratorial assertion by far-right extremists such as racism and fascism harken back to post-World War II fascist strategies to deflect attention away from what they really are in the 21st century neo-fascists. The divisive language of the far right and their evangelical supporters denigrates multiculturalism. It says that human existence in an inevitable pluralistic world is committed to equality is inherently worthless. Rather than framing radical evangelicals operating as grassroots protests, this is really, as one religious scholar puts it, a leader-driven movement whose main goals are power and access to money. The same could be said about the pseudo-grassroots root group such as Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty, who you may have first heard of in Virginia, actually originated with the participation of the wife of the vice chairman of the Florida Republican Party, who was a former Heritage Foundation congressional fellow. When the groups started in 2020, its website links went directly to the Heritage Foundation for a guide to action. Flush with dark money, Moms for Liberties finds support with other far-right anti-democracy groups, including far-right media, pastors, politicians, and in some instances, local county sheriffs. At an Arkansas meeting, I'll just examples here, at an Arkansas meeting of a far-right parents group, Moms for Liberty suggested that local librarians be plowed down by lethal weapons. We also have, um, when you bring the evangelicals in, it's, uh, we have added to this mix is a Texas cell phone company that financially supports school board members whose executives contend, quote, we're going to put God first and to honor God. Koch Foundation money is clearly undermining public trust in, in education. During the first half of 2021, Koch family and affiliated think tanks produced 72 documents with talking points, brief legislators, generally pushed uh, state governments to censor their conception of critical race theory wherever possible. I'm already on page 11 of this. Uh, <laughs> the, the Koch Foundation organization uh, cloaks or hides their message that they're helping public schools uh, with the help of 634 donors who pledge to contribute $100,000 annually to Koch-related groups with the goal to alter, uh, quote, alter the trajectory of the country. So they're using the schools as the mechanism here. Uh, opaque far-right funding and the elevation of far-right Republican leadership discourse that considers the destruction and deaths during the Capitol siege as, quote, legitimate political discourse, provide unique challenges to anti-fascists. This slide illustrates how dark money, far-right dark money, in a simplistic way here, supports um, far-right groups who are warring on public schools and library personnel. When I say library, these are public libraries, and also getting their own candidates in 
people in state legislatures. So we have the emergence of the Heritage Foundation and they get support from the Koch Foundation who gives money to these groups. And then you have this ultra rich giving to everybody along the way. So that's one way uh, to think about it. And so what I'm thinking with students, it's just like, where does this money come in? And this is a uh, diagram is a bit the tip of the iceberg. In today's politics, we hear echoes, and some has been brought up in pre by previous speakers, of the political economy of historical fascism. We see conservatives aligning with far-right extremists who advocate violence uh, using electoral politics to gain inroads in state and local and national elections. We see millionaires, billionaires donating huge sums to these right-wing groups and candidates. And reminiscence of uh, progressive and liberals in electoral politics uh, in the interwar years, they're unable to work together or to figure out how to resist far-right extremism. And I would say that's where the Democratic Party is right now, even if they're thinking about that. Uh, barriers do exist, as some have mentioned, to normative anti-fascist actions. With a growing number of far-right political candidates uh, and this big money, we face new challenges. So one thought is to have anti-fascism can be viewed as a resistance movement. Sounds obvious, but educators can learn from the challenges of resistance movements against 20th century fascism as they need to make necessary connections with supportive community groups. Anti-fascist educators can reframe their actions as resistors, recalling those civilians who resisted and fought in World War II, against World War II fascism. I say this redefining that because I, uh, a student I had this summer uh, told his father and grandparents who are, consider themselves liberal that he was taking a, a class dealing with anti-fascism and the first comment they made was an alarmed, are you a communist? So it's the red scare communism is well and alive in the United States. So how to redefine ourselves and they can also take encouragement from progressive teachers in the late 1930s and into the 1940s. The New York City Teachers Union was quite explicit naming cultural and phenotype racism as a quote, fascist weapon with which the enemy planned to conquer the world. During this same era in the 1930s and 40s, black teachers in racially segregated schools were already teaching Negro history, but boldly expanded their pedagogy by contextualizing the American battle against white supremacy as part of a global strategy struggle against fascism. Educators cannot assume, however, that their fellow teachers are opposed to far-right extremism. As was the situation progressive educators found faced in the 1930s and 1940s, and in fact, such teachers may be collaborators with the far right. Unlike explicitly mid-20th century anti-fascist teachers, most contemporary educators do not understand nor identify with anti-fascism, which I found your Abraham Lincoln presentation really heartening. That's good to know that that's out here. Um, a beginning step is for educators to simply, educators themselves, to learn and teach about anti-fascism and what it opposes. Let's see what we have here. So I look at the characteristics of historical fascism. I present those to get a context, and I put them in a circular way, and I'll let you read those. Also this notion when you critique capitalism in the United States, they often say, oh, you're against democracy. So it takes a lot of unpacking, but uh, anti-fascism is clearly anti-capitalism racisms, ultranationalism, what I call rabid social Darwinism, uh, malevolent charismatic leaders, the anti-democracy 
notion of historical fascism and a militarized society. These circulate around fascism, but they are all component parts of historical fascism. At least that's my typology. Um, it's not necessarily, but I draw from others to construct this. And, oh. Secondly, learning about and teaching about contemporary anti-fascism and anarchism, which I don't have time to do the anarchist part, uh, which I address elsewhere in my book, uh, anti critical to understanding how various social justice movements can be reconceived as part of a larger anti-fascist resistance movement. So you see the support and their desire of fascist anti-fascist movements to undermine fascistic formations. We've talked about nonviolent direct action. A lot of online research to out, uh, I've seen a Midwest Nebraska of all place, teenagers outing, calling themselves anti outing a school board, far right school board member, uh, Alaska, a, a, uh, attorney general, assistant attorney general, but what the media focuses on is the militant self-defense direct action of Antifa. Okay, there we go. So the intersectionality of these different movements would just be wonderful. Uh, Anti-fascists are involved in all of these and others, but not everybody who's in there. I do want to just close with this little piece from a Portland uh, anti-fascist flyer, and I'll go through it. It reads, if you oppose racism, white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and xenophobic ultranationalistic ideologies of the far right, you are an everyday anti-fascist. Thank you. Alan Singer will speak on defending uh, democracy means promoting active citizenship. Alan is a professor here at Hofstra. He's a teacher educator and director of social studies education. Thank you, Dan. Is it only 15 minutes? 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, sorry, there's no PowerPoint. Um, I figured we needed a, a visual break from the hypnotic screen. Um, teachers, schools and school districts are punished if teachers express unsanctioned views on contemporary or historical issues, introduce content and concepts that could hypothetically make a student uncomfortable, or recognize the diversity of the student population. Government funds are directed to indoctrination camps, schools run by white nationalist religious fundamentalists, Books are pulled from library shelves. Euphemisms are used to sanitize the past. I'm not describing Nazi Germany. This is not fascist Italy, the former Soviet Union, or the People's Republic of China. Anti-democratic government control over what gets taught in schools. Actions that are associated with fascist ideology is currently occurring in the United States most notably in Florida, Oklahoma, and Texas. Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida and Greg Abbott in Texas are using the war on schools, teachers, children, and truth in their campaign platforms for potential 2024 Republican Party presidential runs. For the Republican Party in the United States, the war against education is part of its strategy to cement itself in power despite being a minority political party. What can only be considered fascist leaning and anti-democratic action in the United States today makes anti-fascist education that more, more essential. Anti-fascist education is education for democracy. Arkansas, Idaho, Iowa, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas all have laws 
limiting the way teachers can address race and gender in the classroom, and in Alabama, Florida, South Dakota, Utah, and Virginia, the ability of teachers to teach about these topics is limited by executive action and state board of educations. All big problems with these restrictions, aside from the academic freedom issue, addressing these questions, that's the purpose of education, K-12 and in college. And James Baldwin defined this very clearly in 1963 in his talk to teachers. He argues that the purpose of education is to create in a person the ability to look at the world for himself, to make his own decisions, to ask questions of the universe, and then to learn to live with those questions. That is the best way to achieve one's own identity. Teachers, at least good teachers, in Florida and anywhere else, want students to think, to understand, and to support ideas with evidence. Teaching is not about promoting, advancing, or compelling students to agree with you. This approach is good education, not just anti-fascist education. Now, as I framed this paper, I found myself delving deeper into what fascism is and the fascist educational program, especially in Italy under Benito Mussolini between World War I and II. Mussolini and his principal educational philosopher, Giovanni Gentile, who was the Minister of Public Instruction, argued that the fascist reform of education was the most fascist of all education reforms, all fascist reforms. Gentile argued for the primacy of educational reform to promote fascism in Italy. The enormous task is a quote, which fascism sets itself in trying to bring the whole mass of the people, beginning with the little children, inside the fold of the party. That's fascist education. Mussolini's National Fascist Party considered teachers the most important intellectuals for the fascization of youth. Pressured by the regime and rewarded with honors for acquiescing, many teachers, especially teachers of younger children, accepted or pretended to accept the new creed wholeheartedly. A greater number still thought it convenient to submit without enthusiasm to an ever-growing pressure or did not care to hold and profess independent views. Only a small fraction of teachers actively resisted fascist school mandates. Starting in 1931-32, academic year fascist regimes required that every university professor take an oath of office to regime. Now, if you think that's outrageous, they're doing that in Florida today. Because teachers are public employees, they are told they cannot say or teach anything that runs counter to the school mandate. And that's not in the, just in the classroom, that's because they are seen as representatives of the universities and the schools. They should not speak that way when they're speaking for themselves in public. Now, in Italy, while some of the more prominent professors refused to take the fascist oath, the majority of the professors submitted in order to hold on to their jobs. In a 1995 article in the New York Review, Italian philosopher Umberto Eco described how as a 10-year-old, 1942, he received the first provincial award of Ludi Juveniles for his positive response to the question, should we die for the glory of Mussolini and the immortal destiny of Italy? Now, according to Eco's analysis, fascist ideology and education rely on a cult of irrationalism with action for the sake of action and the emasculation of thought. Echo argued that the loathing of learning, the rejection of intellectual thought, distinguished fascism from more traditional conservatism, and that's why it was such a great threat. Kind of echoes what we're learning here in, in the United States and many of the European nations today. It is frightening to think that this kind of education is being promoted now. 
Now, during World War II, the United States War Department alerted Americans about the dangers of fascism. And, quote, fascism is not the easiest thing to identify and analyze, nor once in power is that easy to destroy. However, according to the War Department, quote, it is important for our future and that of the world that as many as possible understand the causes of fascism in order to combat it. I guess the War Department was an anti-fascist institution during World War II. Now, the memo stressed four points. Fascism is more apt to come to power, time of economic crisis. Fascism inevitably leads to war. Fascism can come in any country, and we can best combat fas it by making our democracy work. Wow, that was the United States War Department. Now, the realization that we can best combat fascism by making our democracy work remains at the heart of anti-fascist education. There are definitely conditions that make fascism a threat to democracy in the United States today. Economic uncertainty, a displaced white working class detached from non-white workers and class identity with the collapse of organized labor movement. Media outlets that circulate conspiracy theories, foment hate and irrationality, and promote irresponsible spokesperson. I mean, Tucker Carlson was promoting Kanye West last week. Um, I lost my place. Okay. <laughs> that, that one overwhelmed me. A major political party in the United States is committed to obstruction rather than governing in order to maintain a minority in political power. Democratic institutions that are vulnerable to manipulation and undemocratic institutions from an earlier era that privilege conservative white voters. The emergence of an illiberal democracy, the use of democratic process to undermine democratic values like liberty and minority rights, and a fastidial Supreme Court that blocks efforts to address inequality or embrace human rights and cripples even modest attempts to address an impending global climate catastrophe. This is the United States today. Now, I take four lessons for teachers from the accounts of education under Italian fascism and from the rapid rise of the Nazi party to power in Germany. And I think they are applicable for anti-fascist democratic education in the United States today. Under Italian fascism, possibly at least until the outbreak of World War II, there was space for teachers to question policies and engage students in critical dialogue. Silently waiting out the fascists with feigned acquiescence gave the regime time to consolidate power and involve Italy in German-led military misadventures. From the very start, teachers have a responsibility to be anti-fascist democratic educators. Now, fascists see schools as instituting for promoting propaganda and the introduction of young people to support party institutions, which means suppressing critical thinking and questioning and the destruction of independent unions and professional organizations. Now, again, that was fascist Italy. Pennsylvania, the Republican candidate for governor, is called on the United States officially becoming a Christian nation suppressing all other beliefs. Anti-fascist democratic pedagogy means classroom instruction that highlights critical thinking, questioning and discussion, and teaching students to support their ideas with evidence and to listen to and respond respectfully to others. It means a social studies curriculum that prominently includes struggles to extend democracy and citizenship rights and the right of working people to organize. It means respect for diversity in all curriculum areas. In an area where teachers and curriculum in the United States are under attack by right-wing political groups, an anti-fascist democratic approach to education means promoting active citizen among students. Anti-fascist education means our schools and classrooms must be welcoming places they respect human dignity and diversity. 
Everybody should be able to have a private bathroom. The second lesson is that where there's fascism, there's always going to be anti-fascist resistance, and we need to take back the raised fist from Josh Hawley. Uh, the third lesson is that the shift from a democratic society to an authoritarian one can take place very quickly, especially when a society is in crisis and established leaders and policy are see, political leaders are seen as ineffective. And there are increasingly disengaged youth. We see that now taking place in a number of the European parliamentary governments. Promoting active citizenship for students means modeling active citizenship by teachers. Teachers need to be involved in communities, school districts, and professional organizations, defending the idea that we can teach and that students can think. Teaching democratic teaching, preparing students to be active citizens, is not about being neutral. Now, I'm not talking about specific issues that may be discussed in class. I'm talking about defending democracy, defending democratic institutions, and defending democratic values. Anti-fascist classrooms cannot tolerate bullying and silencing, but teachers also must be prepared to challenge students and colleagues who promote fascist ideology by insisting that statements be respectful and supported by evidence. While working to change a system, you have to be able to work within it. You can't be an anti-fascist democratic educator if you can't hold a job. Herbert Kohl championed the idea of creative maladjustment in his book, I Won't Learn From You and Other Thoughts, on creative maladjustment. Cole argued that effective teachers, especially teachers working with inner city disenfranchised youth, had to find ways to kind of manipulate the system in order to protect their students from injustice, create safe places for learning, and design lessons that connect with student lives and motivate them to learn. So teachers, always remember that the best teaching is anti-fascist democratic teaching. Thank you very much. Yeah, this has got just a very basic question about kind of curriculum setting. Um, so, so who is it? I mean, is, is I mean, is it you know, governor, executive orders? Is it state legislature? I mean, who's the one that's saying, you know, yes or no to you know, covering anti-racism in the classroom, LGBTQ, and so on? Thank you. Well, again, it, it varies by state to state, and some states have a relatively independent uh, Department of Education, like New York. Which, where they set the standard. Other states, especially Florida and Texas, we're looking at state legislators passing laws and then the governor signing them. But the reality is that it, DeSantis in Florida, Abbott in Texas are promoting themselves as right-wing candidates. So they are using things like attack on critical race theory, a kind of a fantasized version of it to promote themselves politically. So it's very much part of that right-wing political movement. Hi, um, thanks everyone for that. I was just wondering if it, uh, you could say something about the role of the teachers' trade unions in any of these struggles. I know that in Chicago in particular, they've had a very 
activated and um, politicised, at least from the outside, kind of um, trade union and have fought various battles there. Um, I was wondering the extent to which any of the trade unions across the country are um, involved in the defence of the, the curriculum or the, the, you know, and, and the battles on the school boards. There are <coughs> some teacher unions who are involved speaking out, but when you look at the whole of the United States and the thousands of school districts and teacher unions, uh, the vast majority are silent on this issue from my perspective. But we do have examples uh, mentioned, I think uh, Rob may have mentioned earlier that uh, there were strikes and opportunities to make connections with community groups uh, and that's what needs to be continued to be done and so those opportunities for community members to support at this time teachers who are being attacked in these states is where uh, s teacher unions should be turning their attention to. Yeah. The United States has a very decentralized school system. Each state, each county, each community has its own contract with teachers. So the teachers union has been severely attacked because of a very recent Supreme Court decision which cut into their ability to, uh, to organize and collect dues. So mm -hmm. the right wing, the fascist end, has been going, trying to break the teacher unions. The AAUP, which we're part of at Hofstra and uh, the university uh, unions, have very strongly spoke out for academic freedom and to challenge the attack on what you're allowed to teach. Uh, and one interesting thing, the AAUP, which the university professors, recently merged with the American Federation of Teachers, which is the K-12 teachers union, and I'm a member of both, uh, to try to broaden their ability to fight back. But again, they, the unions are one of the first things that fascists attack. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I can also say, the AFT, which is the American Federation mm. of Teachers, has local chapters in New York City. Mm. It's the United Federation of Teachers. And then there's also something else called the National Education Association. Um, but somebody mentioned earlier in one of their presentations the Teachers Union, uh -huh. and that was an organization which was actually decimated during the McCarthy period. Yes. In New York City, we had something called the Feinberg Law, and you had to take a loyalty oath that you were not a member of the Communist Party, and the Teachers Union was organized by many people oh, who right. were Communist Party members. And their, uh, their outlook was a broad um, understanding of trade unionism. In other words, it wasn't just wages, but it was connections to international issues and, and to social issues, whether it was, of course, anti-fascism or other concerns. But when you had that Feinberg oath, if you, if you did not take the oath, you were fired. If you took it and said and signed it, then you could go to jail for perjury. So you lost many, many people. The UFT stepped into the vacuum that was created by that. And well, I mean, it's not just in the teacher's uh, union, but in general, that legacy of McCarthyism in which uh, communists left the trade union movement weakened it in, in many instances, including what's going on now. And as somebody else mentioned in an earlier presentation, the weakening of the trade union movement in general goes again back to that McCarthy era when they were, they were expelled from many of the AFL-CIO unions, with some exceptions where you had the, the United Electoral Workers Union, you had left-wing unions which kept them in. So uh, I hope that just gives a little bit of background on the teachers' uh, unions. If I can just give a, a moment of optimism. Um, uh, my, my, my daughter is a high school senior at a public school, and her senior year elective is dystopian literature, which is an amazingly anti-fascist, wonderful classroom. Always good to have a little bit about it. <laughs>
Okay, um, I came here to see Alan Singer speak. I'm a huge fan of New York and slavery. Time to teach the truth. Um, I give walking tours in Lower Manhattan and use that book. Um, oh. And I happen to be here for Monthly Review Press, um, but not to promote a book, but actually with a real like kind of technical or not li more like logistical or outreach question. So some of you have created curricula um, and you've gotten it into schools. And I guess my question is, we have a lot of different individual curricula development groups like ALBA and Teaching for Change and the Zen Education Project. How do they actually get curricula into schools? What is the best way to connect with teachers? So you have these, you know, you have uh, the Koch brothers creating talking points and for media analysts so that they can go in there and demolish critical race theory in schools uh -huh. and approaching school boards. So what is our best approach as people who are either creating curricula or with presses, you know, like creating graphic novels like Brigadistas, uh, which Frazier is the co-editor of, you know, how do we get these books into schools? So that's that's really my question. I'm not coming on Monthly Review's account, by the way, <laughs> but uh -huh. <laughs> genuinely curious. So. Well, please, please buy the book. But also, but also <laughs> to review this book, we have five copies. Okay. I'll just give them to you and you can review them. Can I, can I answer? I know that wasn't meant for colleges, but I will say that I don't know what the rule is for high schools and, and K-12 schools, but in colleges, people put their syllabi online all the time. I know some don't because it's like, it's my eye, I don't want people to use it. But if you, like, I, you get, I got a great idea from another school for a class I'm doing next semester involved with climate change. People can just put their syllabi online, people find them, and then from the university level, I think, it's, I know it's a whole different situation, but it's a way to spread ideas. Uh, I, I've got a network of teachers that I have to graduates, but I, I visit schools regularly, and I go to all the local councils, and all my material is on my website, and all the teachers, and we're talking about thousands of teachers now, because I've been here for over 30 years, are using that material in the classrooms. I, I wish I could have a broader span. Anybody can access my website and all the materials I have there. You know, I'll talk to you after. <laughs> um, I can speak a little bit to um, the, so what we do at ALBA, I can give an example, is the curriculum was developed in conjunction with K through 12 teachers. Uh, I can speak to the one example at, uh, in New York City, Stuyvesant High School has a, um, a program where um, one teacher, David Hanna, who I, and employ you to all look up, has his students take a class on the Spanish Civil War. They're allowed that kind of academic leeway to be able to explore that topic. So the students there like, they are on their own exploring our archive and um, getting uh, biographical information on the Brigadistas and contacting people like Nancy here but who are you know, um, the legacy of the brigade itself and uh, producing material that way. And so we go to them and say, how, what worked in the classroom for you? What can we use our archival material the way in which the you know our uh, you know higher education academics can put material together that meets your needs? So it has to be done in con in um, collaboration with K through 12 teachers, and obviously that there is some issues in that um, you know K through 12 teachers that are do social studies you know they have to hit their regents requirements depending on what or you know whatever that state equivalent is in other states. So um, we find that. Obviously, social studies teachers are the most eager, but often, especially um, English teachers and ESL teachers and um, to foreign language te teachers also have great opportunities to deploy uh, kind of um, literature type material or historical material in their work. I mean, we have a sort of an advantage that like it's in Spain and, um, and Spanish teachers can deploy our material and also several, uh, several literary figures like Ernest Hemingway, Langston Hughes were in Spain so they can English teachers can deploy them so there are limitations given you know the current educational system we have but um, it just has to be done in collaboration with teachers and then you know organizations like ours have to spread that around through our teaching institutes or as you were saying providing that though I mean we provide all of our information on our website all the cur curricula information but you know kind of ways in which to uh, disseminate, right? I guess we it, it is sort of fractured. We should have a, like a big dissemination system where we can get all this stuff out together. I hope that answered the question sort so, of. Well, I would say <coughs> teacher education programs and pre-service and in-service because during those pre-service teaching days, if they've had faculty who have those resources, it's more likely that they'll feel comfortable using them in the classroom because all the research supports 
beginning teachers get socialized out of any sort of progressive teaching along the way. It's the exception uh, along the way. So that, that would be my suggestion. American Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, huge organization. That's where I would focus in. Thanks, Rob. Thanks to our panel. I, I, I have a comment and then uh, two announcements and as we bring everything to a close. One is, I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time for questions because, Jeremy, I really wanted to talk to you um, as somebody with a training in comm studies about your almost throwaway comments about um, media used to be fragmented and then there was this moment when it wasn't and now it's fragmented again. And, um, and, and I think, and I'm, I'm grateful to Nancy for talking about the, the loyalty oaths and things because I think one of the things that we don't talk enough about is the inf impact of the Cold War on our ability to even talk about that moment when we had quote unquote you know non fragmented media. Um, it was because of the, the forced consensus of the Cold War and anti communism, um, and and I think that has in some ways inhibited our ability to be anti fascist and and kind of limited our vision of what fascism is um, to to uh, things like, I mean, it is absolutely white supremacy and, you know, anti-LGBT uh, and, and Q plus, and, but it is also a hostility to working class politics. And I'm grateful to Professor Reed for bringing that up um, because we really do need to address um, those, the issue of, you know, a multiracial, multiethnic, multi-sex, gendered, working class movement. Um, and so thanks, Nancy, uh, for talking about um, how the Cold War has hobbled teachers' unions, but also teaching anti-fascism and even teaching media. Um, there was ne never a moment where, even in that forced consensus of the Cold War, that wasn't objective media, it was manufactured consent. So I'd love to talk to you more about that. On that note, uh, Professor Reed uh, has been in touch with me and laments that he spoke for a while, though I found his comments highly illuminating, and said that anyone who would like to engage with him um, to contact me, um, which you all have my contact information, and I will share his personal email with you, and you can you can ask him any questions. He seriously laments that we were out of time to engage. I'd love to be able to set up maybe a Zoom with him at some point, but I felt like that might be a lot to ask <laughs> at this point. But but anyway, if you have questions for Adolf, please let me know, and I'll I'll give you his email, and he welcomes um, your uh, your email. Um, also, we now will break um, for our buffet. All the presenters and panel chairs. Um, are invited uh, to dine with us in the um, un at the University Club, which I promise you is a very very brief walk from here, um, and I and I hope that um, that you will join us. Um, I do have a list of everybody who said they were coming, and I hope you still intend to come after a long day, and we can break bread and discuss these and other things uh, in more detail. So, thank you, um, and thanks for a really wow day. <laughs> Thank you so much.